I'm teaching AMP1 and something. Woo! I'm not going to say that again. All right, so we were discussing one of the organs that we, that we definitely have to do over here, Dr. Benatti, which is the vagina or the vaginal canal. It's definitely there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I never said it was <laughs> It just isn't there. It's just something that the liberals make up. <laughs> It's really an inside out penis. <laughs> Two box eyes. I will <laughs> remove that last comment from the record. <laughs> All right, so um, where we're picking up, we've gone through the fact that the <clears throat> vagina is a multi purpose organ for birthing. Um, also, discharge of the menstrual fluid as the uterine lining sloughs, um, and then for sexual intercourse. Overall, it's got a tube shape, and then it's lubricated by a serous fluid that's just seeped directly through the vaginal wall. Now, this process of of uh, seeping the serous fluid directly through the wall is called transudation. <coughs> so this is just the physiological process, uh, seeping serous fluid through the wall. Now, and you can see this here in this picture, you'll see that the lumen of the cavity uh, is, is actually got some uh, ridges. So the inner surface contains ridges. These are known as the vaginal rugae. The opening, uh, depending on life status and uh, um, whether or not sexual intercourse has ever occurred, or other types of injury. The opening of the vaginal orifice is typically covered by a protective membrane, and it's called the hymen. And I'm gonna say that this may cover the orifice. And the reason I say that is because typically it's, it's broken uh, during some sort of um, some sort of blunt trauma, whether it's sexual intercourse or um, maybe during sports, it could have been uh, experience. Could have, the the membrane could have broken after experiencing some other sort of sports-related trauma. Uh, it contains openings that that are going to allow the menstrual fluid to pass. So it's not just a complete open or a, a, a complete um, closed barrier. Typically there are these openings to allow for that first menstrual flow and <clears throat> it can rupture for a variety of reasons as I've already mentioned. You would think that first intercourse would be the most common reason, but that's actually not the most common reason. The mo more common reasons are accidental or mechanical dismemberment.
So this is going to be the far more common than through that first intercourse. You might. There might be a little bit of blood in the underwear. Um, there might be actually associated with some discomfort or some pain. Um, also, upon inspection, it may no longer be there. Um, it's kind of ironic because obviously, you know, you think back to medieval times and blood on the sheets indicated that you were a virgin and if there was no blood on the sheets after first intercourse, then you were considered not to be a virgin and there was all kinds of um, stigma that came along with whether or not the hymen was broken during first intercourse. And that really extended for a long period of time. How many of you had a bike that was the female bike and it had the top tube that went really low? You know what I'm saying? So that the frame, normally it looks something like that, but the wheels are back here and then you have the fork of the wheel here. So that would be a male bike. And then the female frame typically was like this or it came up like this and so it was much, much lower. And that was actually to protect in case it fell off of the bike when you went up through the hymen and then you still have indication that you were a virgin. It's kind of ridiculous if you ask me. Because it made those, those bikes are a lot more dangerous to ride just because they're not as structurally stable as a men's frame. But anyways. <laughs> What's that? I thought they were just trying to kill us off. <laughs> yes, maybe. I don't know. We'll just say it's because of the hymen, but really we want it to die. <laughs> All right, so um, to this point, everything we've discussed is going to be internal genitalia, and then we lead into the external genitalia. The external genitalia, this is probably one of the places where at least guys usually uh, really get a correction because it seems like most people refer to the female genitalia just simply as the vagina and that's one part of the female internal genitalia. Collectively what you're looking at here is what's known as the vulva. So the external genitalia is actually referred to as the vulva. And starting at the top of this figure, there is a pad of uh, fat. And it's there because during the birthing process, right underneath the pubic hair, um, this is known as mons pubis. And this is a, a, a layer of adipose tissue. So it's not referring to the pubic hair here. The picture you would think, oh, okay, so mons pubis is another term for pubic hair, but that's actually not true. Right below the surface of the skin, we have a layer of adipose tissue. And what you already kind of understand about adipose tissue is, even though a lot of it is, is not great, uh, some adipose tissue is very, very important. And this is one of those places where adipose tissue is important. So this layer of fat, it is set over the pubic symphysis. So the pubic bone is one of those three bones that make up the pelvis. And the left side and right side of the pubis have a joint that is, uh, contains a pad of cartilage. It's called the pubic synth synthesis. This is a hormone responsive tissue. And during the birthing process, we have an increase in laxity, meaning that that tissue can loosen up and relax. And so the pubic bone actually begins to spread out to accommodate the baby's head and to widen the pelvic brim. If we didn't have that mons pubis, that adipose tissue set over that, it would tear the tissue apart every time you tried to have birth. So the adipose tissue is that cushion that allows that uh, expansion to occur. From, from mons pubis down into the main part of the vulva, there are two 
muscles that help to maintain the opening of the vaginal orifice and also opening of the urethral opening. Not shared like they are in male, uh, in male reproductive system. You have a vaginal opening that leads into the vagina and up into the uterus, and then you have the opening of the urethra that comes down from the urinary <coughs> bladder. So those muscles, they are called labia, and there are two of them. The external labia is labia majora, and then the internal muscle is going to be minor. So it's, it's actually smooth muscle covered by folds of skin. And they are surrounding a region where the vaginal orifice and the urethral orifice are set. That's called the vestibula. Or the vestibule. I was trying to say the uh, vestibular region. Uh, it's just simply the vestibule. Um, we're not referencing the... the uh, the region. And so this is just that location where the vaginal orifice and the urethral orifice are going to be located. And so labia majora and labia minora help to maintain that opening so menstrual flow and urination can actually escape and leave the body and don't be collected in the external genitalia. Jason, did you have a question? So you're talking about this spreading of the yeah. no contraction is is the um, uh, contraction of the myometrium of the uterus, putting pressure on the baby, but pelvic brim is smaller that opening through the pelvis. Baby's head will drop into the pelvic brim and then make its way through that bowl out into uh, the uh, vaginal canal. That pelvic brim and that bowl is smaller than the baby's head. And there are two ways in which the head can be squeezed out. Once you get the baby's head out, the rest of the baby just comes right out because the head is going to be the biggest, I mean, not like that, but it's the, the, the head is the biggest point. Shoulders are actually more narrow than the head, where you can sort of squeeze them through relatively easily, moving the arms around and things like that. So to make it, uh, uh, to accommodate baby's head, if this is pubic synthesis here in the front, that joint becomes looser. And so it'll pivot open. And by stretching it out here, if I just had rigid connective tissue. I didn't, I didn't have adipose tissue, it would rip open. So the adipose tissue cushions and protects and allows that opening to occur without any sort of additional damage. Uh, the other thing that happens, baby's head is pretty pliable as well. And so baby's um, bones in the skull will actually shift and move and basically as it's squeezed out like tooth, toothpaste, a tube of toothpaste. So baby will come out and their head looks a little bit strange and then it sort of collapses back down. They come out and the head's got some interesting morphology. But it, it, it very quickly, it, it comes back to a nice, pretty, cute, adorable baby cat. OK, so the inner uh, labia minora, in addition to helping to maintain the vestibule, Labia minora forms a preface, which is also a, or, or can also be called a skin fold, that is set over a gland called the clitoris. So 
we have the preface of the clitoris right up here um, that labia minora creates a, a skin fold over. So what you're looking at here is you're actually looking at a, a kind of fold away or um, a ghost of, of labia minora, labia majora, and, and the vestibule so that you can see um, the internal structure of glans clitoris, clitoris. And then also notice that you have corpus cavernosum and you have some very similar structures that you should recognize from male reproductive anatomy. Females and males, the glans penis and glans clitoris start out as the same embryonic tissue and then are targeted to become distinctly female or distinctly male. Okay, so embryonically, same origin as the penis. Now, it's a uh, heavily innervated tissue. Um, and part of it, part of its purpose is to be the primary organ for the sexual response in females. It's broken up into two different sections, which you can see outlined here. The, I guess, tip is going to be the glands. This will be an external extension. And it protrudes from the preface, from that fold of skin produced by Lydia Minora. And then we have the bodies. And these bodies uh, are the corpus. which are internal extensions. So there's this divergence here to the corpus cavernosum, and then we also have um, the crus or the crura. And these extensions lead down towards the pubic arch, and they provide attachment into the pubic arch. Now notice, um, while we're still here, um, what's in, in ghost here or that's uh, translucent is going to be the, the skin that makes up labia minora and labia majora. <laughs> you can see there's the urethral opening set typically above the vaginal opening, except for there is deviant physiology here. And in some cases, they'll actually be flipped. There are also very rare cases where the vaginal opening is within the opening of the vaginal opening or within the opening of the vaginal cavity. Um, it's still not shared. The tube goes up back into the bladder. It just it was uh, created in such a way that it empties por partially through a portion of the vaginal opening. So you might have a few surprises when you go to set your first catheter and you're expecting the urethra on top and it's not there. And don't set it up in the vaginal canal. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's inside the vaginal canal, it's going you see it, find it. Well, it's normally very, very close, um, and that's so rare that you probably will never actually have to deal with it, but you may. The uh, switch is a little bit more frequent, but again, not near it. Have you ever? I've seen a swap. Yeah, so you, Rachel has seen a swap, probably just one or two. Most of them are 
that would be the normal anatomy. Okay. All right, so um, this is cutaway of all of the external tissue. Uh, you can still see, and so um, should recognize um, the clitoris there from the previous picture. What I'm showing you here are there are several <laughs> glands that are set here within the vestibule uh, and, and within the external genitalia. Okay, and these glands are primarily going to help to maintain the lubrication for the tissue. One of the glands are the vestibular bulbs. Actually, what I'm going to do, let me just run through these. So vestibular bulbs, the greater vestibular glands, the lesser vestibular glands. Then the periurethral glands. There is a figure in the book, and this isn't really all that clear. There is a figure in the book where you can go and find each of these things the vestibular gland and the greater um, vestibular gland, the periurethral gland, and then also your lesser gland, which is not. Um, illustrated on this figure. Uh, they're, they're all within that uh, vestibular area. Um, so just be aware that those are there and go and take a look at the, the anatomy for the position and location of those glands. They're secreting lubricants that help to maintain the um, slightly acidic pH and also just provide lubrication for <coughs> reduction in, in friction. Now, in addition to the internal and external genitalia, the um, female reproductive system also is going to include the breast and the mammary gland. <laughs> now, the breast and the mammary gland. Um, the major connective tissue is going to be adipose tissue. And locationally, this adipose tissue is going to be set over pectoralis major. So set over pectoralis major muscle. Now structurally, again, a lot of adipose tissue, but embedded in that adipose tissue is either going to be memory glands proper or tissue that can develop into memory glands. So that memory tissue will develop when it's needed. So producing milk is a highly energetically demanding process and we only really want to generate milk when milk production is required and that's only going to be required during breastfeeding. So during pregnancy we have a milieu of hormones that inundate the bloodstream and begin the process of preparing the mammary tissue, developing the mammary tissue, and then by the time baby is born, within just a few days, with additional stimulation from the infant, breastfeeding will begin to... Breastfeeding. <laughs> Breasting feeding is the best kind of feeding for baby. <laughs> Thank you. So pregnancy is when they develop, breastfeeding is how they're going to be maintained. 
So if they're not utilized, let's say maybe uh, mom decides that it's not important to breastfeed baby, they would still develop during pregnancy, and then if she uses formula or something like that, breast, uh, the, the mammary tissue quickly degrades. It's uh, on demand. So you need to breastfeed in order to maintain that tissue. World Health Organization right now recommends in developing nations that you breastfeed for two years in developed nations like the United States up to one year and then slowly lean to uh, complete solid food starting at about the 11th month to 12th month of, uh, after birth. Um, that being said, I guess if you decide that it's really necessary to breastfeed your child for a long time, it will continue <laughs> for a long time uh, and there are certain sectors of the U.S. population that will breastfeed their children into six, seven years of age. I've never asked, hey, so uh, how's kindergarten? <laughs> Do you enjoy breastfeeding? <laughs> it is really weird. I have a feeling that these guys are the guys that probably end up uh, really attached to mom. <laughs> I'm never going to leave your home. I'm going to live in the basement for the next... 60 years of my life, mommy. All right, but I digress. Um, so the mammary glands, they consist of five major parts. And you can see the major parts illustrated in this figure here. Uh, so we have lobules. And these lobules, which you can see here, these are the, the lobes or the lobules of the... Um, uh, of the tissue. So lobules and then lobes. The whole thing is a lobe and then each individual little sac-like structure is a lobule. So these form masonine sacs and then the lobes which is the whole structure consist of the groups of the yes, acid eye. Yes, Kat? How long do you suggest breastfeeding? In the United States, one year. Is it 31? Man, it's probably not one month. That's just one That's just one I don't know where you're going to be. I know that, like, our secretary at church had a baby, and she said that the doctor suggests, like, six months now, but her baby had a milk allergy, so that may have been one. So that recommendation, you're not quite understanding. Six months exclusive. At six months, you begin to bring in solid foods. And so really soft foods are dissolvable. But you continue to breastfeed up until at least a year and begin to wean them off completely so that by the time they're a year or a little over a year, they've completely separated. Um, in a lot of cases, you, you kind of encourage the, the child to make that decision as well on when to stop breastfeeding. And they, I mean, they'll give it up once they begin to realize that they can have huge varieties of food instead of just milk. They get pretty excited about that. What if you had like quick totally? How do you breastfeed like five children at one time? <laughs> like plumper, I mean, what would you do? You could do some excess amount of milk if you have to do uh, you sit down and <laughs> you just it's have like conveyor belt and you just you know, <laughs> time and you shift them. And just, that's all you do your entire life. <laughs> um, no, most of the time with with that many babies, they 
which fortunately that's really, really rare. Um, twins, twins you can handle pretty much exclusively with breastfeeding, um, and you're still breastfeeding a lot. But once you get up into those really high numbers of kids, three, four, five, seven, what's the most right now? I think it's eight. Tough ones. You, uh, you, you, you really can't handle it metabolically, so you supplement with, you supplement with formula. Any other any other weird questions? One month. One month? I do I had no time with the babies and I kind of said one month. Yeah. I don't know. We said a week. Yeah. You're lucky if your milk is in within a week. All right, well sorry little guy. Um pizza for dinner tonight. <laughs> You're not supposed to feed a baby honey either until they're at least a year older because it has botulism. Honey has botulism in it, and they don't have the, uh, a good enough uh, digestive system to be able to handle that. And so they can get really, really sick. Make sure that you learn a lot before you decide to have babies. <laughs> Well, I showed you guys this What about what happened if I gave him a three month old of peanut? <laughs> I ain't gonna shell the thing, I'm gonna make that boy shell it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, high allergy foods like that. Um, it's very rare for, and, and usually it's not the milk that's an allergy, it's, it's, it's some of the protein that's present in milk. Um, so high allergy foods or foods that are common within the human population to induce allergies is, yeah, not a good thing to start out with. I think my first feed is going to be peanut butter. We'll just see what happens. We'll just let it ride, you know? We only live once. <laughs> Next thing we're doing is shrimp. <laughs> it can't burn out, kill nothing. Else. You like how I turn like totally red now? <laughs> okay, so the lobules, the little lobes, the big lobes, and then we have the duct work. It's called the lactiferous duct. And these drain from the lobes. <laughs> and then as we enter into um, or, or near the opening through the nipple, we uh, collect into sinuses. And then the last part here is a part that's not actually illustrated on the figure, but within the gland itself, there are specialized cells. Most of the cells are devoted to production of milk, but there are also additional types of cells. They're called myoepithelial cells. And the myoepithelial cells are uh, what are going to help to facilitate milk letdown or release of milk. And so these cells actually have contractile <coughs> ability. That's why, hence, myo, they're smooth muscle uh, epithelial cells, kind of a mix of muscle cells, smooth muscle and epithelial cells. Uh, and so they contract for milk letdown or ejection. I didn't really finish this. Let me go back to the, the lactiferous sinus real quick. Um, these are going to accept milk from the ducts. And then are the delivery conduit to the nipple. What? Hold on. I'm not hold on. Yeah, hold on. I'm not ready to end yet. Come on. Yeah, you got nothing going on. Yeah.
Are we good? Are we good? Does everybody have it? Catch up. All right, the last thing I'm going to get through is to, is to take you through the external breast. Okay, so on the external surface, you have the, uh, the delivery site is called the nipple. And it is surrounded by a darkened layer of skin tissue called the areola. This is a part of the tissue that has a high concentration of nerves. So high concentration of nerves and also vessels. And it creates a neurological circuit that feeds back into higher brain centers to help facilitate the production of <coughs> oxytocin and prolactin, two hormones that are necessary. Oxytocin to help out with milk letdown, prolactin to promote the production of milk itself. The areola, during pregnancy, it actually goes through a process of getting a little bit darker. And this is actually pretty interesting. So it, it increases its, uh, its tone, becomes darker, due to a presence of a higher concentration of melanin, which is one of the pigments that creates darker skin colors. So this is going to happen during pregnancy. And the reason that this happens is it facilitates what would be called latching on, which is the baby's ability to latch on to the nipple to begin sucking. And the reason that this is happening, babies, whether or not you know this, they're basically blind when they're born. Their vision is really, really fuzzy. Did you win or lose? I won. <laughs> so because their vision is poor and very, very fuzzy, they basically can see contrast. They don't see detail. So by having additional melanin concentrated in the areola, you got a nice big target to aim for. So this highlights the target for your blind baby to facilitate <laughs> suckling. How long does their vision stay like that? Like not persistent. It starts to slowly improve, um, and I don't remember the exact time sequence, but um, they're still pretty visually impaired a month or two after after birth. You'll actually finally see a point when they start to recognize things like your face. Or if, you, or, or if you have boys, not girls, but boys, they begin to recognize the ceiling fan when it's turned on. And they'll see you and they'll smile at you and it's too like, oh, yeah. So when is your nipple back normal? When is your what? You said your nipple got really dark. So like, Eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so this is a really good place to break. Oh, especially since it's 10.55, I'm sorry. 